Hello, it's Kristen Von Fox here. And today I wanted to talk about the top 10 telltale signs of soul loss. But first, a little bit about who I am if you don't already know. I'm Kristen Von Fox and I help clients who feel stuck, who feel checked out and feel like they've lost vital parts of themselves due to the trauma to get their power and passion for life back using ancient shamanic techniques to empower your soul. And I wanted to share a few of the top 10 signs about how people go about you know, processing and looking at what are the symptoms of trauma. Hi, April. Um, just so that you get an idea of some of the symptoms that you might exhibit if you have gone through a traumatic experience and have some type of soul loss. But first, what is soul loss? You might be asking yourself that question. And I wanted to, to share some of the symptoms that I have in my book, but first, a soul loss is this idea, and I'm gonna be quoting a little bit about psychotherapeutic approaches versus the shamanic approaches, which you can also refer back to the video I did a couple days ago, and I'll share the links for that. But when we look at someone who's processed trauma, we see that there's some level of dissociation, right? If there's a trauma that's happened that is difficult on the soul, that part of the soul may feel like it has to sort of check out or dim out because that situation was so terrible, so challenging to that person that it compromises the person's energy. And what you'll find is if someone has had soul loss, it's believed that part of their soul can actually leave their body because of the trauma. And this happens as a defense mechanism, right? It's like no one wants to lose parts of their soul, but it would happen if you know, you're in a situation, it could be a physical car accident, right? You could actually be leaving your body because there's such a fright that happens. Hey, Russell. Um, you could also have, you know, if, if you've been in that accident, you might feel really dizzy, not very oriented in your body. You may find that you're not as physically present. You're in that state of shock and it can be very hard to get back into your body. And while a lot of the soul oftentimes does come back into body, right, if you have a, a shock or a trauma, you know, you're kind of numbed out in, in that fight or flight response for a little while. And then sometimes it's, it's um, easier to come back afterwards, but sometimes we don't feel like we ever fully come back. And that's what I'm talking about today. When we go through a traumatic experience where we don't feel like we're ourselves afterwards, something has shifted. So whether that's a physical accident, or a difficult relationship, you know, sometimes we get into a relationship, we give so much of our energy away, or something bad happens, we feel betrayed, maybe we're cheated on, maybe that person moves away, so you know, we have such good feelings for them, but there is a reason why we have to disconnect from them, and there's some sort of loss where we just feel like we've given up that part of us that loves, or that part of us that trusts because it's been betrayed, that just isn't the same afterwards. And it's this belief that, in the indigenous cultures around the world and cross-culturally for over a hundred thousand years there's been indigenous cultures around the world that have been looking at soul loss and treating it immediately looking at when someone has some kind of a trauma and working with that trauma very quickly to it was believed to retrieve part of that person's soul to bring it back into their body and i'm going to be talking a lot more about soul retrieval at the end of this I'm going to be inviting you to a presentation I'm going to be doing that's free. It's all about soul retrieval. But today I wanted to focus on some of those top 10 telltale signs that you may be exhibiting soul loss. And I have those written in my book. I have, a, a, I think I'm about 19 in there. So I'm just going to pick a few of my favorite ones today to talk about and give you some examples so that this can really make sense to you. Uh, so, you know, when we go through trauma and trauma changes us, that's when we know that we may have some soul loss that happens. And so what are the physical symptoms or what are the energetic symptoms or emotional symptoms that we might be exhibiting? So the first one I'm going to talk about is, and I'm referencing my book here if you see me looking down, is a loss of brightness in one's eyes, smile, or energetic general presence. And this one is one that blows my mind because when I'm working on clients, there's a huge shift that happens. And I see in many of the cases, their eyes change, they become bright. So if someone goes through a traumatic situation, because it affects the soul, and then we, we have this idea and understand that part of the soul might feel unsafe and may disconnect. In psychology, we call it disassociate. So that person would dissociate and then they would not be as present in their body, right? And so you can see this in the eyes. If you're talking to someone, especially, if you um, are talking to someone who's just gone through a really difficult time, right? A friend comes to you, they're crying, they're, they're asking for help. You can see that there's this loss of power that starts to happen in the eyes. And what that looks like is they become dull 
Uh, you can see when someone's really passionate about something, their energy fills up with energy and you can just see their eyes become bright, sharp, clear. But when someone is processing trauma and it has not healed, it could be 10 years after the traumatic situation happened. If they talk about that and their eyes go kind of flat and they, you can just see they're not the same person anymore. They've lost something. They've lost part of this vitality. That's a really good way and an indicator to know that someone has had some soul loss. And I've had this situation talking to people. They'll talk about something that was really difficult. They'll look really checked out, really just weak, almost like there's this power that's missing from their eyes. And then as soon as they talk about something different or something that is really exciting to them, then all of a sudden their light comes back, this passion comes back. And you know that that's really that fullness of their soul that they're able to access. But when they're still stuck in the trauma response or stuck in this symptom of soul loss, you see that there's an absence of that brightness that that person may generally have in other areas of their life or may have used to have in, in that area of life. So for example, uh, you know, I had gone through a lot of trauma when I was growing up, uh, many different things I'm not going to go into right now. But when I look at uh, pictures <laughs> from when I was a kid, when I look at pictures, even from a number of years ago, right before I started doing soul retrieval, I look dead in the eyes. I'll actually post some pictures because it's crazy. I, I have a, a friend who, um, who brought me a picture a couple of years ago of me as a teenager. And I don't have a lot of pictures from when I was young. I just have a few here and there. Um, and most of them I look like really checked out and really sad. And when he showed me this picture, it actually scared me. I just saw all of this darkness in my eyes, just this like, deadness just see i could see how checked out i was and i even had to change the photo on one of the books i published a couple of years ago because i just like i just see all of my dad's like trauma honestly i just see all of the ancestral trauma that was in my eyes in my face and so now i i love to look at pictures of myself now <laughs> because i just look like i have life in me and that's after hundreds if not thousands of soul retrievals that i've received done on myself all of that work to call in my power back. And now I find that, you know, there's there's much more brightness in my eyes. And, and when I work on clients, I also find that there's a huge shift in some of them, not all of them, but there's some sessions where I just, you know, I don't even want to talk to them. I'm like, go look in the mirror, go check yourself out and then come back and let's talk. Because you can just see this night and day, like people become present in their bodies and you can see it express itself through the eyes, right? I don't know who said the quote, but eyes are the window to the soul. And it's really true if you're talking about soul loss to see how bright and how present someone is when you look into their eyes. So that's one of the signs. If someone does have um, have soul loss, then you'll see that there's a big shift. And I see Russell, you say, how do I get your soul retrieval book? Um, I have it on Amazon, but if you stay tuned for the webinar, I'm gonna be offering a really good deal on it because I really, um, spoiler alert, I'm like really trying to offer this book for free, just pay for shipping because I want this book to get out to everyone and the links are not live yet. So um, once you check out that, that webinar in uh, the next couple of weeks, then you'll see all of that information there. So I'll, I'll provide those links to register for that and then you can get my book and just pay for shipping because honestly, I just want everyone to have these tools. This is really important to me to get this mission out there of helping people find their power again. That's that's what I'm all about. So back to soul loss symptoms. Um, and that was a good question, Russell. Thank you for asking. I see you, I hear you. Uh, I love you very much. I'm glad you're here. Uh, so moving on, I just wanted to share, and these kind of, I, I like to group these together, but I have in here sadness and general depression, anxiety and fear, and I have them separate, but I'm going to kind of combine them to, to share a little bit more just now. But I wrote in here, feeling the absence of joy or excitement you used to have before the incident, which caused soul loss. This can turn to depression when you feel so low on energy and joy that you no longer feel like yourself and no longer feel like life is worth living. And I think we all can tap into areas of that, especially if we've gone through something difficult, especially if we've gone through a hard breakup or maybe we lost our job and our home. And you know, sometimes everything happens at once, right? When it rains, it pours. And sometimes we can go through a challenging time the challenging season, the dark night of the soul, and everything seems to go wrong. And then we feel like we've lost our energy, we've lost our power. And then of course, and this is this is how indigenous people and shamans would talk about this in, in their cultures, would they would say when someone has lost parts of their soul, that it would create voids, right? If part of your spirit is now no longer feeling safe in the body or just wants to check out because it's too hard and leaves the body, then you have this energetic void, right? And when you have that energetic void and you're at a low vibration, 
vibrating at that lower frequency because the trauma has affected you and maybe you're just having like a sour attitude about it or maybe you're just really angry about it then you attract those vibrations right it's the law of attraction simply put that when you have a lower vibration or frequency that you're operating out of because you're missing that light that joy that power that confidence whatever it was that left then you can attract depression anxiety um, jealousy, anger, fear, it, it all depends. So for example, if someone is in a relationship, they're cheated on, they're betrayed, their partner lies to them, then they can have this part of them that was trusting and loving and carefree in that relationship or any relationship. And once that part leaves, then they can track that energy of jealousy. And then maybe even in that relationship or potentially if they break up and then go into future relationships, there may be that sinister part of them that's always like waiting like, hmm, what's this person doing? Should I check their phone? Are they gonna do this? Are they gonna do that? And we begin to attract, not only attract those patterns of attracting people that would potentially betray us because we're missing that piece of power, but we also have this sensation of opening ourselves up to those lower vibrations to come in. So that depression, that sadness, um, and this is a talk for like a whole nother thing I'm gonna be focusing on next month, but we can also attract lower vibration entities or energies that settle into those places feed off of our fear and our anxiety, the one, the parts that are ours, and then essentially create a problem that's bigger than what ours was initially by having these other lower energies that are attracted to us, that sit with us in that place where we're wounded, that we're actually missing our power that is our soul, right? So I'm gonna be focusing a lot on that next month. We're gonna be doing a whole shifting out the shadows month right before the solstice because I wanna make sure that as we get ready to go into this next season and get ready for the new year that we're really shifting out those lower vibrations. It, this is time, it's time right now for us all to step up into our power, call our power back, call our confidence back, call those parts of ourselves that have been missing maybe even for this entire lifetime since we were a kid or lifetimes or even for our families. It's really time to step into our power and to clear out what's not serving. So to clear out that jealousy if we've picked it up because we've been betrayed, right? So when you've had soul loss, it does open you up to anxiety, right? The fear that something's not gonna work out, that energy can settle into that place in your soul. Um, and, and we look at post-traumatic stress disorder too, that's one of the symptoms I have here that I actually wasn't gonna talk about today. But I, I will talk about that today because we, you know, when we have PTSD, there's a long list of symptoms and some of the symptoms that I, I did put in this book are that you know we have difficulty sleeping, emotional detachment, agitation, flashbacks, hypervigilance, mistrust, and it all is dependent on what part of us that usually it's that those pieces that were calm, that were easygoing, that thought everything was gonna be safe and okay, and then we get stuck in this fight flight response because the part of us that would be really calm and peaceful and grounded is gone, right? Because something bad happened, so now we have to be prepared just in case something bad happens again. And unfortunately, that's the way that the parasympathetic nervous system will, will shift and will go into this fight flight response that sometimes it's really hard to get out of unless we are able to fully retrieve the pieces of our soul that felt safe, right? Is this making sense? Can I get like a mm-hmm if that makes sense to you guys? April says, mm, that is super powerful. I never thought about it that way with relationships. Yeah, and I'm actually, April, I'm gonna stick around for a few more minutes because that's one of the things I'm gonna be talking about. Um, and this stuff is all really applicable to most anyone, right? It's like you, you may not think you have soul loss and then you hear these symptoms, you're like, all right, maybe my mom does. Oh, maybe I do. Oh yeah, my brother does. Oh, my boyfriend does. You know, like you start seeing these symptoms when you start looking at it as perhaps you maybe lost a little piece of your power. And you know, another big discussion I'll open up just a tiny bit right now is, well, what is the soul? Isn't our soul already complete? And I truly believe that when we connect into our higher self, when we pray to those higher forces that we can connect into like that bigger sense of self, but we are humans. We're in a world that's not perfect. There's a lot of really shitty things happening often. And I think that that does make an effect. And when we look at trauma and even the little things, you know, trauma is, trauma is a spectrum. So that could be anywhere from, you know, I write in my book, like not getting ice cream from the ice cream man, like feeling like there's something wrong with you because you can't have that treat or feeling like your parents are poor and they can't afford the, the, the toys and the events and the things that other kids have. That could feel also like a, 
a betrayal that you don't understand about money that you just feel like there's something you lost out on or a friend moves away that was your best friend your confidant and ever since then you just don't even want to socialize you could have something as much as like a bully coming and affecting your levels of confidence or you could have something really traumatic like a car accident you could lose a limb you could be raped you could be abused and this is all a spectrum but you know some of us are really sensitive and I truly believe that all of us are really sensitive until we have bad things happen. We kind of put up that armor, right? To block ourselves from feeling it as much because we're blocking and trying to protect those parts of our spirit that are checked out and those, those voids that are now in our soul, right? You know, I'm opening up so many big conversations here. So, you know, please feel free to ask questions. You can ask questions in the comments box. I'd be happy to answer them. If I, if I bring up anything that um, brings up some inspiration, I can even make some videos specifically off of this question. So feel free to ask. This is a place for, for learning for everyone. Um, April says I'm here for the whole discussion. So make it as long as you feel, ooh, I got you for a little while. Uh, hopefully not for forever, it's Saturday. <laughs> at least at least in New York um, and on the East Coast. So I'll let you guys have your Saturday back soon. Uh, so, you know, something else I wanted to talk about, I feel like I'm like pulling up all the symptoms that like bring up big cans of worms and I love it because I love opening up this discussion because it's important. It's important to us to look at every angle of how we relate to other people. Bullying sucks. Yeah, Russell says bullying sucks and it does. And it, you know, and we see it so prevalent in our society right now, especially cyberbullying. It has such a great effect on people's levels of confidence on who they are and you know, I'm gonna, because you wrote that, Russell, I'm actually gonna move to one of the other symptoms. Um, loss of, ugh, I'm like, which one? Loss of power, I'll go with, um, you know, when we feel less powerful than we used to, we feel as though we gave away our power or maybe someone took it away from us. And I'm gonna be talking a lot about this on the webinar because I think it's really important. But there's, you know, this idea that we can give parts of our spirit away and that people can take them. And I think on some level, in the bigger grander scheme of things i think that we are aware of the lessons that we choose in our life that's just my personal belief you may not agree with that and that's totally fine i love you anyway um and in that case that, that that's a belief that you have or maybe a belief that you're open to hearing about that i do believe that we do give consent in some energetic way for even bullies to give us those lessons by giving away our power but sometimes we do it unconsciously right we like think someone knows more than us or think someone has more power of us so we give away our power and after that we feel like that piece is missing we feel extra vulnerable especially with bullies right or we have to become the bully to be able to like push people from getting to that vulnerable space that's now been created because we've given our power away or we've had some sort of a loss and again, like that can happen when we give our, our energy away to people, to different things. The, the next symptom I was gonna talk about which ties into that is an unexplainable attachment to another person, event, or object outside of oneself. Uh, sometimes the soul loss causes a feeling of disconnection within the self, so we cling to people and objects that provide a feeling of connection to mask what feels internally lost. In other cases, another person might be holding onto a part of our soul or a piece of our soul that has been left in an event or at a specific location. And I go into this in my book. I actually do a whole exercise on how to retrieve parts of your soul that you've left at different places. Um, and, and a case study that I have about that where it shifted my life, it was my personal story um, on that. But what, what can happen is, especially when we are in relationships, if we give away part of our heart, right? It's like, oh, that's endearing, right? I love this person so much. I wanna share my love and give my heart to them, right? Or someone might say like, I'm giving my heart to you, or you broke my heart, you shattered my heart, right? And, and those things oftentimes come after we give our heart away. We feel it's been abused or misused, and then we feel that is affected within us when someone else has you know, that, that power over us. So we can give parts of our soul away to other people. And although it may sound really like romantic and endearing, it actually really hurts us and creates that vulnerability. And sometimes, and I think that this is where, this is where codependency oftentimes comes to, into play, that we feel the need after someone, especially if there's like violence in the relationship or some kind of gaslighting, we can feel that we, and need to be around that person even though they hurt us, right? They caused this void in our soul, they caused a soul loss, and then we feel that we only have our power or feel okay when we're around that person because they have that part of our soul. So then when we're not with that person, it's like an addiction, right? It actually plays on the addiction pathways in the brain with the, you know, the all of your neurotransmitter neurochemistry that we then become addicted to the trauma because we're also addicted to the person that has our power because that's the thing that we're missing and that's the thing that we want. So 
we can see codependency and that you know and i think about a certain example with this i had a roommate in college who was constantly on the phone with her mother and her mother was really overprotective and they were just joined at the hip and i see this a lot with parents who just love their children so much that they smother them and they're overbearing and over controlling and they actually take that person's ability to look after themselves and to take care of themselves and and be and be the person that would know how to protect themselves later in life so that when we grow up it, it's little kids right oh yeah mom wants to protect me mom's a better bigger protector but when she takes our power or we give it away and say mom's a better protector than i am my own protector we become adults our parents age we move away you know, perhaps they die and then we have the sense of like, I have no resources to protect myself because that was mom's job. And then it becomes even more of a vulnerable space because that person who had that piece of our soul that was using our power or, or essentially protecting us as a sense to, to make up for that piece that they had taken. And I'm saying this in an unconscious level. I believe that when parents do this, in that example, that it's not conscious, that I don't think any parent would want that for their child, but it's amazing how many clients I've had to get their power back from a parent who was meaning well, but actually totally took their power. So that could cause that obsession or that, uh, that need to be around that person or in the situation where they had lost that power. Um, so if that makes sense, let me know. I'm gonna move on from here because there's a couple more that I wanted to talk about today. And the next thing was a kind of like a no-brainer, right? Feeling like something is missing, having a sensation of something missing emotionally, mentally, or physically, or the sensation that a part of the self is gone and feeling an internal void, right? And when, we, when we're not feeling traumatized, we usually feel really good. Right, like we, if, if we have not gone through trauma or not gone through a lot, we usually feel like, oh yeah, like I've got my power, I can do what I wanna do, I can set goals, I can accomplish them. But then if there's something that has been lost, right, we've had some level of soul loss, and then we feel like something is missing. And I, I keep thinking about, you know, the God-shaped void, um, thinking about, I, I did a lot of research and work with people who have uh, chemical dependencies and addictions, and also with mental illness too, sometimes playing in, hey Lena. Um, and, and, and really looking at how, when we've gone through a trauma, the part of the spirit can be gone, and looking through the lens of AA, and I think they have some really great tools there. I know they have helped a lot of people I know, so I really support a lot of the things they say there. And to play off of that, there's this idea that we all are walking around with this God-shaped void, right? That there's something that we need to fill with God because there's a part of us that you know needs that. And I'm gonna go as far, maybe be radical to say that, of course, I think that having spirituality in your life in whatever form it aligns with you and your spirit is really helpful. And I know that that has really helped me in my life. But I would say that, you know, maybe not so much of a God-shaped void as I really believe that when we're missing our power, it's our, our own shaped void, right? It's like the pieces of our power that are ours, right? So we're, we're yearning for them because we are stuck. And that just makes me think, again, I, I share the case study of someone that I had worked with um, in, a, in a chemical dependency mental illness outpatient unit when I was in the psych ward. That was in my first video I can reference um, that I did uh, not too long ago on the psychological approaches versus the shamanic approaches to trauma. But I always think of you know this, this client that I had who ended up running into the brick wall and he felt like he lost these pieces of his confidence. He was always stuck in that old place, right? Like stuck with that obsession, the, the symptom I just read about, um, looking at, you know, that this, just being stuck in that situation where he had lost his power, feeling like there's a void because hello, something is gone. It's your soul or you wouldn't be obsessed. You wouldn't be stuck in that story. You wouldn't be stuck thinking about that trauma if there was nothing that you lost behind, right? You're like the same example. You're not gonna go around looking for your favorite sweater if your favorite sweater is on you, right? You know, unless we have some kind of memory loss, like the glasses on our head, right? We'll like forget we have them until we find them. But if we have our car keys on us, if we have them in our hand, then we're not missing them. But as soon as they go missing, we're gonna obsess about everywhere we might've lost them, right? Because something is lost. So we can feel that within our energy and within our soul as well. Um, just a little minute to breathe, yeah. Mm, to center. These are these are some these are some interesting 
characteristics here and I don't know how you guys are relating to these or if anything resonates or maybe it doesn't but uh, I've just found that with my clients and even with myself when I was exhibiting like tons of soul loss had so many parts that were missing these these concepts really helped me to sort of have those aha moments of like oh snap I think I'm missing some pieces um, and I really do think that most of us are to some degree we don't all go through like terrible car wrecks where we like lose our whole families those people have definitely had trauma but going to school, getting bullied, getting picked on, being like molested, you know, those are things that like stick with us and take pieces of our power. We wouldn't be fixated on the wound, right? Unless something was missing, we would not be stuck there. So I think there's something to, to look into these and really think about where am I getting stuck? Where am I feeling like something is missing? Where am I like going back to constantly this idea of you know, high school, you know, why was that so hard or whatever that is for you. I really believe that we can lose pieces and leave them behind or give them away and then get stuck on those things and either not be able to move forward or repeat the patterns because we've lost that piece of our power and the part of us that would be making different choices or resonating in the higher frequency is missing so we keep getting stuck with the old story until we fix it right like that's i think that's why a lot of patterns come up because we're being challenged by the universe is like are you going to heal this yet or are you just gonna keep perpetuating the wound um, that you already know is a wound that is a part of you that's lost through this lens of, of shamanism and soul loss. Of course, there's many lenses and I think they're all really helpful. And I'm gonna be focusing on this one because this is the one that's worked for me and this is the one we're talking about, this one I wrote a book on, so we're gonna keep going. Um, blah, 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 here we go. Uh, <laughs> loss of joy, laughter, innocence, and playfulness. You might feel like you have to be tough, cold, and mature just to make it through life. Does that resonate with anyone? Uh, you've lost the sense of childlike wonder you used to have long ago, or perhaps you can't even ever remember having it. Uh, so I want to talk about this one. I've had a lot of clients who have had to grow up before they needed to. Either their parents got divorced and they had to take over roles and responsibilities. Oftentimes I find that when, um, and this can go, you know, this can be like non-gender specific too, but I'm just talking about and referring to cases that I've, I've had a lot of. Um, but I, I've seen a lot of men who don't have mother, or I'm sorry, men who don't have fathers that are present in their life, whether they're just out of the picture completely or they don't see them as often or their parents don't live together, oftentimes take on the role of being the father or the partner to the mother in some way, feeling like they have to take care of the mother in more ways than just being the child and receiving care because there's been a parent that's been, been removed or there's this sense of, like loss of the ability to be a child because there's so many more important things that have to happen, right? Putting food on the table, making sure mom is safe. So I found that that's been a pattern I see oftentimes. It can go either way too. Sometimes women can have a parent that is not there and then they feel like they have to step in as the parent. Um, so that, that happens many, many times. But I'm also really thinking of you know, children that go through really traumatic things when they're young and then feel like they're just not safe to be children anymore. They're just not safe to be playful, jovial, innocent, because there's something more difficult that they have to look out for. And then I, a case is, is popping up into my mind, so I'm just gonna share that because that's what's ripe at the surface right now. But I have, uh, and I've had this, this story happen a couple times. I've, I've had many clients who have had similar stories where a mother or a father was using substances or was having like a, a health condition and you know, like just passed out or they overdosed or they had some kind of a heart attack and the child being seven or eight, I think that's the, that has come up in a couple cases around that age, any age really, where the child then has to all of a sudden grow up, give mouth to mouth resuscitation, call 911, do something to take care of the parent. And then after that trauma happens, they just don't be, feel safe being a child anymore. They feel like they have to be responsible for their parents in some way, so in, in a way they also become the parent, right? They give up the innocence and joy and time to play and they focus on how to be mature, how to be an adult. And this can rush that process of learning and playing and using imagination because guess what? Like imagination world is secondary to saving mom's life and making sure that she's okay, right? So when traumas like this happen, we oftentimes find that the child has to just grow up fast and then they don't feel like they've ever really been able to be in touch 
with that childlike self because that has had to been put on the side. They've had to give up and sometimes by choice to give up that part of their soul to take over those responsibilities. Hey Paul, nice to see you, yay. Um, so, so we really find that people can have to grow up fast and maybe it wasn't something so traumatic as seeing someone overdose or having a mother that you know like passed out drunk or anything like that you know maybe she had a heart attack maybe she had a heart condition and maybe it was just that you know your parents weren't really around you had brothers and sisters and no one was taking care of them so that became your job that oftentimes becomes the job of the oldest sibling in the home and so we find that people like that and it might not seem like it's something traumatic oh mom's just not here and that's kind of sad, but I have to take care of and make lunch for everyone, right? But, but that can also cause us to have to disown these parts of our spirit that just wanna play and be taken care of. As children, we want to and need to be taken care of, and if the parent isn't able to do that, then that does absolutely have an effect on development and on the spirit and can cause soul loss. And the next thing I wanted to go to was foggy memory recall, especially from childhood, if you have a period of your life where you just don't remember what happened, you know, and I had this when I had severe abuse happening in my childhood, and I just, you know, for many, many years, I had no access to any of those memories from about five to eight, just blank, couldn't tell you anything. So I'll go through pictures and I was like, I have no recollection of that. And, and that was because I had processed some really deep trauma there. And I find that people who, especially if there's, you know, some kind of like rape or incest or, or like, any kind of like really bad abuse that, excuse me, uh, had a little burp there. <laughs> no, I find that when someone's gone through some kind of trauma like that and a concentration, especially if it's something that's ongoing for a period of time, that person just leaves their body, right? They, they disconnect, they dissociate, as we call in psychology, because and, and they have that soul loss because it's not safe to be present in the body. And so you might look back at your childhood and be like, I don't remember a damn thing, right? Because oftentimes there's something difficult that happened. And I have a lot of clients that say, I think, I'm, I'm starting to think I was sexually abused between these ages, but I don't remember, I have no memory recall. And that's a top telltale sign that you have had soul loss because the soul has had to leave so it can protect itself. So that's absolutely something that happens and that's a really great way that, to, to know that you have, um, you have lost a piece of your soul. And I'm also gonna say you can have a concussion, right? You can have a physical injury that happens that would cause you to not have that memory. We can also argue that that's also soul loss, right? The part of the body, because you can have soul loss for body parts that are traumatized, that part of the soul leaves to protect the, the, the being, to protect the person in that situation. So there, these are all different levels of soul loss that can happen on many different levels. Usually happens because of um, some kind of emotional trauma that just feels too much on the soul. We decide, you know, this just sucks, I'm gonna peace out, I'll see you guys later, we just check out, right? A part of that soul, it's gone. But the great news is we can get it back and it's not that hard. It's with a process called soul retrieval. And I'm gonna be telling you guys so much about that, so don't even worry about your pretty little faces. I can't even wait to talk more about soul retrieval. Um, yeah, I'm just, I feel like I'm just gonna, go on with these two last ones because they relate and they relate to something that I believe Russell said earlier, but that sensation of a broken, shattered or missing heart, feeling like your heart has been hurt emotionally or physically after a heartbreak or a trauma, the same feeling you can apply as if your voice is missing or you can't speak up for yourself or your solar plexus is affected, right? It can affect all of the chakras and the chakras are the power energy centers in our body. We have seven in our body. Um, it's argued that we have many, many more that are outside of our body, just around. Um, but these are also good terms for like different sections of our body where we may feel sensations. And if our heart has been broken, it freaking hurts, right? Like that actually, you'll feel the pain of your heart hurting or feel like, oh my God, part of my heart is just gone. I can't even access it. Um, feeling like after we go through a difficult time that just like our heart is just zoop, something is different. And it can be really disorienting, especially if we go through a breakup 10 years later, still missing, still gone. And that's when we know that we've given up a piece maybe to someone else as we were addressing before, or maybe that we are like literally, we part of our soul and part of our heart was just like, peace, this sucks, I'm out. I don't like this bad relationship. I can't do it anymore. Um, and typically we'll find that in situations that are long-term abusive or long-time uncomfortable, challenging, sometimes it doesn't have to be as much of abuse, but an uncomfortable relationship where just 
we're not feeling the feelings anymore and we just go through the motions. And I really see that as like a slow drip soul loss, right? We can be giving away little pieces of our soul and our spirit on a daily basis because a job sucks, right? We hate our job, but we have to stay there for the money. So we go through this turmoil, even though it doesn't align with our soul's purpose, we don't feel alive, we don't get lit up. And there's an essence of it's because every day we're just letting a little part of our heart die because we don't like what we're doing, but we feel like, oh, I gotta get the paycheck, gotta show up for the boss, gotta show up because this is like a real job. My parents would be upset if I just, you know, worked from home or did X, Y, Z. So we can find that these soul losses can also happen as a result of situations that are just like uncomfortable cringe, but we're still gonna face them anyway. So Russell said, I feel like a part of my soul is coming back now. Oh yeah, call that power back. And I think that the number one step to that is really increasing the awareness of where we may have given parts of our spirit away. I go through a lot of different things in this book. I'm gonna be going through them all on my webinar that's coming up, which is on how to reclaim your energy from or with soul retrieval and looking at those ancient tools, these shamanic tools that have been around for ages that actually talk to these wounds about how to just freaking get your power back, how to go through the motions to call in your soul, call in your power, because it's time guys, like it's no longer okay to just walk around as an empty shell to feel like we're missing pieces of our soul. You can spend decades in therapy and if you still feel like you're stuck, then it's because there's a part of your spirit that is ready to come back because you're aware. Most of these soul parts don't want to come back initially because they feel like the trauma is still there, right? If we have like a really mean, challenging parent who's domineering who's abusive of course you're like it's going to be safe to have that part of you that would be feel powerful and challenge them be gone because if you were to access that part maybe they would hurt you more maybe it's a way to protect yourself but as you grow up you're an adult you're able to have that self agency for yourself then it's time to get your power back so you don't keep attracting the patterns of people who are domineering or people that would reflect that person because you're missing your power to be able to stand up for yourself and change that vibration within you to change the situations around you. So I would lovingly welcome you to come onto my webinar. I'll put the links in this video so that you guys can have access to that. It's absolutely free. I'm gonna be talking more about my book. I'm gonna be talking more about soul loss, but mostly about soul retrieval and some next steps that you can take to really activate your power because it's time. So if you guys have any more questions, I'd be happy to answer them. Feel free to write them in the, in the comments below. And I just love you guys. Thanks for tuning in with me today. And I'd love for you to register for that webinar. And in the meantime, think about where you may have lost some of your power and get really clear because the more clear you get, the easier it is to call back. And that's one of our next steps that we'll be doing when we're on that webinar. So mm, much love to you guys. Have a really beautiful day and I'll talk to you soon. Bye. Mm -hmm.